Welcome back to Proxam, everybody. And today we're going to be talking about fire prisms. And I know we've done a video comparing fire prisms and night spinners before, but I wanted to specifically talk about fire prisms and how to make the most out of them in your games. Because as you know, fire prisms are very powerful grab tanks, but they do require a little bit of finesse and a little bit of good positioning to make the most out of them. So what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to be specifically looking at the fire prism and we're going to go over its stats, weapons, and special rules. We're going to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of the fire prism, go over those again after the nerfs, and we're also going to be looking at a little bit of a trick that most Eldar players that have been playing for a while might know, and I like to call it the fire prism shuffle. And it's a bit of a trick, but again, like I said, most veterans probably are already aware of it, but it's a good way to get the most out of your fire prisms throughout the game and make sure they stay alive. So when we're looking at the stats of the fire prism, it has pretty average stats. Ballista skill 3+, plus, toughness 7, 12 wounds, 3 plus save, movement 16. It's a little bit more fragile than the wave serpent, and it has really fast movement. So it's able to kind of get to where you need to go fast if you need line of sight on something or need to get somewhere in a last-ditch effort to capture an objective or contest, it can definitely have the speed to do that. Now, when looking at its main weapon, the Prism Cannon, the Focused Lance profile is exceptionally intense. And I'm not just talking about intense in a mild way. I'm talking about it is the best anti-tank weapon in our Codex. And yes, this thing actually does beat the damage of a D-Cannon, believe it or not. So, for a long time, the D-Cannon was probably the most powerful because it had the blast keyword, but the Focus Lance profile of the Fire Prism is just a lot better than it base. Even though, again, the D-Cannon can do mortal wounds, there's not a high chance of that in general. However, the Dispersed profile is mediocre at best against infantry it's really nothing special and if you have the chance you should always be using the focus lance profile and there are cases against some enemy types where the focus lance is actually better than just the dispersed pulse when dealing with infantry heavier infantry that is so the focus lance is going to wound most vehicles on two and even the tougher vehicles, it's going to wound on a 3+. plus. So with all of the changes that a lot of the Space Marine vehicles got in the past couple weeks, Land Raiders got Toughness 9. Wow, right? Toughness 9. And of course, the Predator got Toughness 8. So those buffs are quite substantial. However, the Fire Prism is still going to be, at most, wounding those two things on a 3 plus which is very reliable strength 14 ap minus 5 so those predators aren't going to be getting armor saves the land raider will get a, just a 6 plus against it basically and each shot does 3d3 worth of damage which of course you can command reroll if you really need to get that land raider or that predator killed you can definitely do a command reroll on that and the great part about both of these profiles is they have 60-inch range, which means they can pretty much hit anything on the entire board at any time as long as they're within line of sight. As for its secondary weapon, it's, it's really not important. It can be armed with a shuriken cannon, but it's probably not worth the extra points. It is a 5-point upgrade, and you're probably never going to be in range of anything worthwhile anyway with this thing. So it's probably best to just save the 5 points and just go with the regular twin trick and catapult for the secondary weapon. As for vehicle upgrades, are there really any upgrades worth taking? So, to be honest with you, I like two upgrades on the fire prisms. And that is the crystal targeting matrix and the vectored engines. I think these are both extremely effective, especially the vectored engines with the recent nerfs to fire and fade. As you can't use that every turn anymore, vectored engines is going to be more important to be able to make up for that. 
However, the star engines and spirit stones are really just never worth it, I think, on a fire prism because A, you're probably not going to be needing to move extra inches with the fire prism. And the spirit stones, you never really want to take damage with the fire prism either, so spirit stones rarely come into play. Also, with the trick that we're going to be doing, we're going to be using multiple fire prisms. And honestly, having a damaged fire prism with less ballistic skill isn't that big of a deal when using this strategy. So crystal targeting matrix is a great upgrade that basically ignores the negative to hit modifiers. Like, for example, if your enemy unit is in dense cover, this can ignore it. And it can also ignore hard to hit units like flyers. The heart becomes the mind on this, as well as several other harder to hit flyer units and targets that might normally give the fire prism a hard time when it's trying to hit it. And vectored engines, of course, was recently nerfed. It got bumped from 10 points to 20 points, but it's still really good for allowing your fire prisms another turn behind obscuring terrain, because that's really what you want to do with this ability. You want to move your prism from obscuring terrain from behind it to shoot something and then use this ability to move it back behind obscuring terrain. It's only a once a game use, but it helps save your fire prism for another turn of shooting. So let's go ahead and look at the strengths and weaknesses of the fire prism. So obviously its strength is it's absolutely amazing at destroying tanks and monsters, especially if they have invul saves with the linked fire stratagem. It can blow through invul saves destroy tanks, destroy monsters, absolutely destroy anything, including titanic units like the new Knights Codex. Very effective weapon. And it has a very long range to boot, so you don't need to move around a whole lot to shoot. Hey, that rhymed. <laughs> I'm like the Dr. Seuss of Warhammer, I guess. So weaknesses though, right? The weaknesses are that this grav tank is extremely fragile. It has almost no defensive capabilities. Wave serpents have the serpent shield, which gives them a 5 plus invul save. Fire prisms do not have access to this. And the anti-infantry ability of the fire prism, even though it has a dispersed shot, is subpar at best. So what I really wanted to show you guys in this episode is... I wanted to show you what I like to call the Fire Prism Shuffle. Now, many veteran players will know this ability through and through and will have used it in probably almost every one of their games that they're using multiple Fire Prisms. But this is a strategy or a trick where you use two or more Fire Prisms in a list and you alternate using them with the Linked Fire Stratagem and vectored engines to keep them behind obscuring terrain for multiple turns. So essentially, you would move one wave serpent out, or excuse me, not wave serpent, you'd move one fire prism out, shoot, use the linked fire stratagem so that the other fire prism you have behind terrain can contribute to that fire prism shots, and then use that fire prism's vectored engines to move back into obscuring terrain. And what this does is it keeps your fire prism safe while dealing maximum damage. Because if you're moving both of your fire prisms out of terrain, you're only going to get one turn of sh safe shooting with both of them. But when using this strategy, you can prolong that for multiple turns as long as you have enough command points to spend on the linked fire stratagem, which is two command points, but with the changes, you should have plenty of command points to use every turn past the first turn. So what you need for the fire prism shuffle to work is two or more fire prisms. Of course, having three extends the duration in which you can use this trick. Each one must have vectored engines, so it is a bit of a tax. You do have to pay the 20 points for vectored engines. You can't use fire and fade anymore, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, this is what I used before the nerf, is I used fire and fade every turn to, to basically pull this off. But because you can only use fire and fade once a game now, it's better to use vectored engines for this purpose. You don't need to move very far with it either. And you need the two command points for the linked fire stratagem, and maybe one for matchless agility if you really, really need it, but it's often not even needed because of how we're going to do this. So what I'm going to show you next is a couple of diagrams showing you how to actually perform this trick on enemy units.
So I've typically found that this is most useful starting at turn two, because on turn one, typically not that much is exposed unless you go second. So we're going to start off and assume that it's turn two and your movement phase. So we have two fire prisms behind the ruins. Now, again, you could have three doing this, but just for this example, we're going to have two. So one of the fire prisms is going to peek around the ruins just a little bit, just to get line of sight on the enemy vehicle. Then in your shooting phase, the fire prism peeking around the corner shoots the vehicle while the other one contributes using the linked fire stratagem. So what that means is, is that for two command points, you're going to get four shots at strength 14, AP minus five, three D3 damage, ignoring invul saves. That vehicle, unless it's a super heavy vehicle like a Land Raider or something like that, is most likely going to go down, especially if you have a couple of Strands of Fate rolls, or I should say Strands of Fate dice, or command rerolls at your disposal. That vehicle will fall, and it will fall hard. Then, at the end of your shooting phase, you're going to use the Fire Prism that shot, you're going to use its vectored engines to move back behind the ruin, and if you need to, you can always re-roll the dice with matchless agility. Only if needed, though. Most of the time, you're not going to need it because you're only going to need like probably a 2 or maybe in some cases even a 1 to get back behind obscuring terrain. So in most cases, you won't need it, but just in case an enemy unit can flank them or get around the corner of that ruin to get line of sight... You may need a couple of more inches to be totally safe from everything. So you may want to use matchless agility if you whiff really hard. But again, probably not needed in most cases. So at the end of your shooting turn, the enemy cannot see you at all. You're behind obscuring terrain. And you've successfully killed one of their vehicles right off the bat. Now, the enemy's turn comes along. And on the right flank... He's going to try to move up to capture up the other objectives, right? And obviously this depends on what else is going on in the game, but chances are your opponent is going to want to get to some objectives, which means that some of his units are going to be compromised. So he brought up his transport in this case. He dropped off 10 Space Marines. Now it could be anything. There could be a Redemptor Dreadnought around here. There could be a land raider. There could be a lot of different units that he chooses to put on that objective. But let's just say for the sake of argument, it's just like something like a predator or maybe a land raider, right? Well, on your turn three, you're going to now do the same thing, but with the other wave serpent. So that one wave serpent that shot during turn two, it's vectored engines is used. We can't really use vectored engines on that vehicle anymore because it's only once a game use, right? So... Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to move the other fire prism outside of the ruins to make sure we have line of sight on that vehicle on the right-hand side of the board, and that's that blue rectangle you see over there with the little blue dots. Those are representing your opponent's forces, basically. So, now, we have our fire prism moved out, and it has direct line of sight now to that enemy vehicle. And just like before, we're going to do the exact same thing. The other fire prism is now going to shoot, and the one that was shooting the previous turn is going to contribute using the linked fire stratagem. And in this way, you're going to get four shots, strength 14, AP minus five. That tank is going to go down, and it's going to go down hard. Unless it's something like a land raider, in which case, again, you might need some command rerolls or strands of fate dice to make sure that thing goes down or you might need some contributing fire elsewhere from your army now the prism that just shot is now going to use its vectored engines because remember we didn't use that before we didn't use vectored engines on that vehicle we're going to move it back behind obscuring terrain again so essentially we've done the shuffle right we've moved one fire prism out shot moved its vectored engines back then on the next turn, we did the same thing with the other fire prism, moved it out, shot, used linked fire, and then moved it back in. So that way you're getting the full use out of both fire prisms without having to expose both of them in the same turn, 
right? And what this actually does is it prolongs the use of your fire prisms and allows you to get more value out of them over the course of the game. Because remember, fire prisms are something that your enemy is going to look at and as soon as you reveal your fire prism, as soon as you move that fire prism out to shoot something, kill it and leave it out there, that fire prism is going to die next turn. I guarantee you, fire prisms are not tough. They're not wave serpents. They can't hold up to any kind of firepower. They will die. They have no real way of surviving. So in those cases, why not use this ability? And yes, it does cost command points to use linked fire, but let's face it, against a lot of stuff in the game that has invul saves, we were probably going to use linked fire anyway. And what this does is it's basically another way of getting the maximum value out of your fire prisms while also keeping them alive throughout the game. And as you can see, this is already turn three. We only have really a couple more turns left in the game, right? And our fire prisms have been behind obscuring terrain the entire time. Now, let me put something else out there. You can actually use this ability for almost the entire game if you plan it out correctly, right? Now, in this example, I only have two fire prisms. So at most, we'll probably get three turns out of use of this. Fire and fade and two vectored engine moves will allow you to do this three turns in a row. However, we can actually get this up to four turns in a row if we have a third fire prism. Because remember, linked fire allows you to contribute up to two other fire prisms. So if you have three, the two other ones that are not going to move outside of the obscuring terrain can also use their shots to use the linked fire stratagem to, you know, basically contribute to the one that is shooting. And this will give you four turns of uninterrupted, untargetable, heavy tank killing firepower. And honestly, I actually recently had a game with the new rules where I did just this. I had three fire prisms and I was doing this for four turns in a row. And my opponent was like, what nerf? right? He was actually a little upset because he was excited to play against me because he had heard about the nerfs. His own army got buffed and he was telling me that, you know, it was ready to out, you know, are you ready to lose? <laughs> and, um, of course, when you pull something like this and your fire prisms are basically in a position where your enemy can't target them the entire game, it could be a little frustrating, but this is just goes to show you that even with the nerfs to Crawford Eldar that happened, the nerf to Fire and Fade, the nerf to Matchless Agility, we still have a lot of ways in which we can actually keep our units out of line of sight, out of harm's way for a majority of the game. And yes, we can't do this every single turn now because Fire and Fade is a once-a-use, you know, once-a-use stratagem per game. But what we can do is we can prolong the survival of our units like our fire prisms for a really long time, as long as you're willing to invest in it. So in conclusion, I think that fire prisms were and still are a very powerful anti-tank slash monster unit that can basically hit anything on the board and kill it. No matter how heavy a target it is, it's going to do some serious damage to whatever it hits even if it has an invul save. And with the right strategy and planning, fire prisms can actually remain hidden for most of the game while dealing extremely heavy damage to your opponent's toughest targets. And by the way, if you guys have a lot of space marines in your local meta, you're going to see a lot tougher land raiders. You're going to see a lot tougher predators. I know that, you know, for example, to be honest with you, the players that I face often don't use those kind of units. They use things like Redemptor Dreadnoughts and that kind of, you know, those kind of dumb things. Really competitive, highly... Well, to be honest with you, meta units. However, with the changes to Predators and Land Raiders, even some of the players in my local gaming group are actually considering taking a couple of them just to try them out to see if they're actually pretty cost-effective. And 
my thoughts on it are that you're probably going to see a lot more of these things pop up and fire prisms are going to be even more effective against these targets. Fire dragons are a very good unit for anti-tank, but they don't ignore invuls. And they have a very short range and on top of it all, they need a transport. So they can be a little bit more expensive when all is said and done than a fire prism, and they're not going to be able to stay safe for the entire game. Now, personally, again, I love fire dragons. I think they're a very good unit. I think they're very cost effective for what they do, even after the nerfs, but they're a fire and forget, right? You're going to fire them, and they're probably going to die next turn. Fire prisms, on the other hand, are going to basically be able to get a lot more value for you over the course of the game. So, again, they're, they're not quite as much burst damage as fire dragons are, point for point, but they have more accurate, more sustained fire over the course of the game that's going to, again, add up probably more value over the course of the game than a unit of fire dragons will. So, again, like most units in the Eldar army, fire prisms actually do take a lot of finesse, planning, and strategy to use correctly. I have seen, and this I haven't seen this for a while, but you know, a couple editions ago, I have seen newer Eldar players using Fire Prisms in a way that probably a lot of veteran players would look at and be a little bit confused by. Fire Prisms are not your average Lehman Russ battle tank. They're not a Predator or a Land Raider. And they're certainly not a monolith, right? They are very fragile. So that means that you have to use them extremely carefully because not only are they fragile, but they're very expensive, especially with the hike in vectored engines. You're going to be paying 185 points for a fire prism. So if you're going to be paying that many points, you better make sure they survive the entire game, right? Or at least most of it. And the fire prism shuffle is a trick that can keep your fire prisms not only alive for most of the game, but make sure that your fire prisms are continuously adding value and killing enemy units and smiling while doing it. All right, everybody, that's it for today's video. Go ahead and leave some comments if you have any suggestions or tips about how to use fire prisms. I'd really like to hear your comments and your input. And... Another thing, I think fire prisms are also probably going to not only become more popular, even despite the nerfs, but I think they're going to become more powerful as well. Because I actually think that when more people start using the Beeltan as well as the Uthway Craft Rolls, the value of fire prisms pretty much skyrockets. Beeltan fire prisms and Uthway fire prisms are much more effective than fire prisms in a Hail of Doom list. And Hail of Doom is a fantastic craft world trait. I have nothing against it. It's very good. But Fire Prisms in Uthway or Beeltan are absolutely nasty. All right, everybody. That's going to be it for today's video. See you guys later. Peace out. Have a good one. Oh, and don't forget... My bad list contest, the deadline is in a couple days. So make sure that you guys turn in your bad lists if you have them.